As I'll say, Mashiach was born on Tisha B'Av, and we're already, after Chatzos, and already we're sitting up on the chairs. The mood is slightly changed. We're heading into a, on the one hand, the base of Migdash is burning. And according to one of the Chazals, Rabbi Yechonen said if it was up to him, it would have been Mesach in the fast on the 10th of Av, because the majority of the base of Migdash burnt on the 10th of Av. On the other hand, Haschalta de Peru Anusa, the beginning of the punishment, is the Iker according to the way we paskin. And Haschalta de Peru Anusa, the beginning of the punishment, is when the base of Migdash starts to burn. On the other hand, it's after Chatzos, and we're headed towards the Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av, meaning that the calamities and whatever it is that Klai Shah has gone through for the last 2,000 years, we learn from it and we internalize it and use it in order to be zochet to the rebuilding of the base of Migdash and the resettling of Yerushalayim. In the Megillah Seicha, we read, Haisoke Almona, Echa Haisa Badad, Yerushalayim sits alone, lonely, abandoned, Haisoke Almona, compared to a widow, the Almona who could be in a room full of people, she could be with her children, her grandchildren, her siblings, but she's alone because her husband is not there. She's alone because the other half is not there. There's a certain feeling of being alone in the crowd. And Yerushalayim, when the Shekhinah leaves, the husband, Kavi Yochel, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in the relationship with Klai Yisrael, the husband is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Klai Yisrael, and the metaphorical relationship is the wife. When the Shekhinah leaves Yerushalayim, so the wife is alone, Ha'isob Adad, like an Almona, even though there's a crowd, many of us are here, Yerushalayim is populated, but we have the status to a certain extent of that Almona. And then the Megillah goes on and says, Bocho sivke balayla. We cry, we cry in that night. Why do we cry in that night? So Chazal say, Layla shal bechiyas miraglim. The miraglim came back, Klai Yisrael cried tears that were unnecessary, like the proverbial father who says to his child, child's walking around the house crying, whining for no good reason, and the father says, you want to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. And Klai Yisrael, we're crying for no good reason. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, you're crying. I'm promising you Eretz Yisrael. You want to go into Eretz Yisrael and you're crying. You have, you have that opportunity. And instead you cry. I'll give you something to cry about. It becomes a Lel Bechia, the Doros, throughout history. Tisha B'av becomes the night, the day where we cry. And that's the lesson. You want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given us something to cry about for all these years. But the question is, why do we have to cry for something they did 2,000 years ago? Why are we crying today? Why are we being punished for somebody that some ancestor did? They cried for no reason, so what's it got to do with us? Why should we have to suffer because they cried? Maybe we wouldn't cry if we were them and we were given the opportunity to go out there to sell, perhaps they wouldn't cry. So why is it that we have to be punished for something that they did so many years ago? Why is it our fault? And the answer is, Vidima sa lechiyo. The tears are still on the cheek. That means that the tears that they were crying, we're still crying those tears. Which tears are those? Why were they crying? The Dora Midbar was crying because they were promised you go into Eretz Yisrael. And what's underlying that crying is we don't want their Ruchnius. We don't want to be in Eretz Yisrael. We don't want to have those obligations and those responsibilities. Vidi Masa we're still crying those tears. When the Kedusha is available, we're still crying those tears. Do we really want that Kedusha? How much of it do we want imposing on our life? Somebody said to me recently, you know, the Gedolim have decided this about Sneas and this about computers and this about whatever it is they've decided about. He said, nobody can tell me what to do. So I said, you're right. Nobody can tell you what to do. The Gedolim Israel can only tell us what we should do. That they can tell us. And if we think that what they're telling us is because they don't understand that they're making a mistake, that's worse than anything we're doing. 
Whatever we're doing, no matter how long the shekel or whatever the filter we don't have on the computer, whatever filter we do have on the computer. And if they say, well, they don't understand, they're not in touch, that's worse than any of ever we're doing. The Dimasalach, yeah, we're crying. They can't, can they tell us what to do? Even the Rebona Shalom tries to tell us what to do, we don't do it. So they can't tell us what to do. They can certainly tell us what we should be doing, that they tell us. And if we don't accept it, so then, it's not because Chas Hashom Gedoli Yisrael are out of touch. If we don't accept it, it's because V'dimosa Lechia. We're running away from the Kedusha. We're not interested in being told what to do. So we're crying the same tears that were cried all those years ago. We're crying those exact same tears. And therefore we haven't changed, we haven't learned the lesson one bit. And a person says, you know, I have trouble relating to Tisha B'Av. People say that all the time. I have so much trouble relating to Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av happened so long ago. A base Amigdash, I don't know what a base Amigdash is. I don't know what a Nebuchadnezzar is. I don't know what a Klal Yisrael is. It has nothing to do with me. No kidding. No kidding. Because I'll say that when Tisha B'Av came along, 600,000 Jewish males got into their graves. And the next morning, 15,000 were dead. 15,000 did not climb out of those graves. That means from one day to the next, they didn't know if they're going to see the next daylight. Anybody have trouble relating to Tisha B'Av today? Anybody ever had trouble relating where a person doesn't know if a soldier is going to see the next moment, if a Jew walking in your shalim is going to see the next moment? With all the troubles in Klai so we have trouble relating to, of all, of all the holidays, the last one that we should have trouble relating to is Tisha B'Av. It's a shem, it'll turn into a moid, it'll turn into a celebration, and then we won't have trouble relating to it either. But nobody can come along today and say, we have trouble relating to a Tisha B'Av. I don't know what a Tisha B'Av is. Oh, we know what a Tisha B'Av is. Only too well we know what a Tisha B'Av is. My young maidens and the young men went prison. They were taken in prison or taken captive. That was then. What about those taken captive by clubs, by drugs, by alcohol, by all the immorality and the vulgarity of the world? Trouble relating to Tisha B'Av? Organizations around the world for Jewish kids who are struggling with not only Yiddishkeit, they're struggling with life. I don't have any trouble with relating to Tisha B'Av at all. No trouble with Tisha B'Av. What we need to do is figure out what do we use Tisha B'Av for? We're giving a piece of equipment by Kodesh Baruch Hu. We're meant to take it, we're meant to use it, we're meant to internalize it, we're meant to grow from it. And after Chatzos, we sit on a chair because we understand we're in the growth process right now. Anybody who's not sitting should be sitting up now. We don't sit, we sit low when we're mourning and when we're not mourning, we don't sit low. And therefore, anybody who is sitting now should sit up, should sit on a surface, because we are no longer at that degree of mourning. Moshal is told of a king who's got a prince, and the prince is trying to go to sleep. And the father, the, the king, comes over, and he pulls, just as the prince is about to fall asleep, he pulls the pillow out from under his head. And the prince is more awake, he's about to fall asleep, he wakes up, and so he just puts his head down on the, on the bed without the pillow now. And again, he's about to fall asleep. And the king starts sprinkling water on him. The prince again sits up with a start. Then again, he tries to get comfortable, tries to fall asleep. And again, he's about to fall asleep. The king takes and puts ice cubes on him. And that really springs him up. He says, Daddy, why are you doing this to me? And the king says, I don't want you to fall asleep. I have to keep waking you up. And when you're about to drift off, I have to wake you up, and even in a more unpleasant manner. And the Melech, obviously, is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we're the children. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're about to fall asleep. Got to wake up. And you have to wake up, and it may be unpleasant. And it becomes progressively unpleasant as Klai Yisrael go along. Because we're in a greater danger of falling into that slumber. So HaKadosh Baruch cries out to us on Tisha B'Av, wake up, wake up. We have to take the lesson and see what the lessons of Tisha B'Av are. Gwar says that somebody who goes to a chasna 
and he's mesameach the chosun. It's ki ilu bona achas michuros Yerushalayim. It's as if you rebuilt one of the ruins of ancient Yerushalayim. You go to a wedding, and you're mesameach a chosun. It's as if you rebuilt one of the ancient ruins of Yerushalayim. What's one thing got to do with the other? What's that chosun got to? You went to a chosun, you made the chosun here. What's it got to do with churbos Yerushalayim? And the answer is, why was Yerushalayim destroyed? So we know the first base of Migdash is about Azar, Gilarais, and Shvichus Domim. The second base of Migdash is destroyed because of Sinas Chinam. Sinas Chinam, first of all, first and foremost, means the Sina towards Talmud Chacham. And don't make any mistake about it. The first Sina was the Sina that the Amaratzim had towards the Talmud Chacham. And then, among the Talmud Chacham themselves, there's also a lack of interpersonal sensitivity. That's what destroyed the second base of Migdash. It's the gullus that we're in right now. Somebody who goes to a chasna, what is your first reaction when you go to a wedding in Israel, America, wherever you go? You go into a wedding hall. What table am I sitting at? Who am I sitting with? What are they serving? And when can I get out of here? So we go to a chasna. Who are we focused on? There's that I word again. Me. When, what will I eat? Where will I sit? What will I, how much time am I going to spend here? What about the chasen and the kala? Who are you there for? Are you here for yourself or are you here for them? So if you go to a chasen to be misameach and you're focused on somebody else, it's ke'ilu bana achas michurvos Yerushalayim. You rebuilt one of the ruins of Yerushalayim because Yerushalayim was destroyed because of the focus on ourselves. Do you know Rabbi Shimshin Pinkus Zatzal? His son said, I think it was at the Leviah, he said, he never saw his father, Rav Pincus, in his entire life. He never saw him close a window that somebody else had opened or open a window that somebody else had closed. Could you imagine that degree of Bein Adam L'chavira's sensitivity? Could you imagine that degree of concern? A person walks into the room, they're hot, they're cold. The first thing is, how is my comfort level? How comfortable am I? But there's another person in the room who closed that window or opened the window or put on the air conditioning and turned off the air conditioning. It's such a simple thing, it's almost science fiction. That a man never touched or adjusted the temperature in a room. So that's the sensitivity we're meant to absorb a little bit of on Tishabov. Focus on somebody else. It's not my world. I live with other people. Other people are in this world as well. That's the wake-up call for Tisha B'Av. There was a man, Rabbi Avram Genechovsky, the Rosh Yeshiva, the Chibin Yeshiva, here in Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Genechovsky had a chavrusa on Lel Shabbos. An Avrech, a kolo man, used to come to learn with Rabbi Genechovsky every Lel Shabbos, after the Suda. One Friday night, he comes to the Rosh Yeshiva's house, and... He forgets that it was Shabbos, and he rings the doorbell. And he's very embarrassed. He just rang the Rosh Hashiva's doorbell. And he waits. And he waits. And then nothing happens. So he starts knocking on the door, and he knocks, and he knocks, and he knocks for about 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, Rav Genachovsky, a blurry-eyed Rav Genachovsky in his pajamas, comes over, opens the front door. There's the Avrech. I'm terribly sorry. I was exhausted after the meal. I put on my pajamas, I went to sleep, I forgot we had a chavrusa, please forgive me, I'll change and we'll learn. He went into his room and he changed, he came back, they learned. After his nifter, his family said he didn't forget. Avram Genachovsky did not forget he had a chavrusa, just as no fish forgets that it needs water. Rav Genachovsky heard the doorbell ring, and he knew that if he would answer the doorbell at that moment, how embarrassed the Avreich would be that the Rosh Hashiva noticed that he rang the doorbell. So Rav Genachovsky put on his pajamas and pretended to be sleeping so he could come to the door and tell the Avrech it was the knocking on the door which woke me up. That sort of sensitivity, that sort of concern that we realize there's somebody else in our world. That it's not only about me. And you know where that comes from? Where the originator of that attitude is Aaron Akoin, who was Nifter on Rosh Chodesh Av. And Rosh Chodesh Av was a yard site of Aaron Akoin, the Oev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom. So when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu, you take out Kla Yisrael from Mitzrayim. Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, 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 no. My brother's going to be jealous. Shlach no biyad tishlach. Let my brother take him out. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, no, he won't be jealous. 
Virocha v'somach belibo. He'll see you and he'll rejoice in his heart. And as a result of that, Aaron Akoin was zochet to the choshen that went over the heart. Virocha v'somach belibo. He'll see you and he'll rejoice in his heart. The trick is to see the other person. Virocha. You have to see. You have to realize there's another person there. Virocha v'somach belibo. And by the way. We often think, yeah, Aaron wasn't jealous, he was born good. It's not quite like that. Aaron was rewarded with the Choshen, which is quite a reward. Korach gave up his eternity because he wanted to wear that Choshen. That Choshen was a very, very prominent reward. And we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewards the Fum Tzara Agra. The reward is proportional to the suffering, to the pain, to the investment of the mitzvah. That means Aaron worked on himself to change his heart to not be jealous, to be happy for the other person. That's why he was zochet to the choshen. If he could do it, we could do it. Have a mitalmidov shel Aaron akoy. Perhaps not to his degree, but we certainly have an obligation to make the effort to try, to see the other world. Viracha v'samach belibo. Reb Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, young lady came to Reb Moshe, story that I mentioned a couple of years ago, which is just so Reb Moshe. Young lady came to Reb Moshe, she said, her mother was married to an American GI stationed in England, and they had chuppah and kedushin. And then they split up with a civil divorce, and they never had again. And then her mother married somebody else. This girl was born from the second union, she became a Baalas Tshuva, she's engaged to a Yeshiva Bachar, and they want to get married. And she says to Rabbi Yisrael, my friends told me that perhaps there's a little problem here, I better speak to you. So Rabbi Yisrael said to her, tell me the Shaila again. So the girl said, my mother was married to an American soldier stationed in England. They had a chuppah, kedushin, a kosher marriage as documented. They split up with a civil divorce and no get, and then my mother married another man, and I'm born from the second marriage. Is there a problem? Reb Moshe said to her, come back in 24 hours. 24 hours later, the young lady comes back. Reb Moshe says to her, Mazel tov, zolzayin midglik, I give you a bracha. She built a bayis neman Israel. Thank you very much. She walks out, happy as a lark. Talmidim were sitting there, I said to Reb Moshe, Rebbe, we heard what you heard. We heard what you heard and you taught us that's a mamzeris lamahadrin. How could you possibly matter that? Rabbi Shah said, you're right. Based on what you heard, she's a mamzeris. But in the last 24 hours, I took the trouble of contacting the United States Pentagon. And I asked and they said, yes, indeed, there was a soldier by that name stationed in England. But simultaneously, he had a wife in the United States and two children. And there's no question that if that woman wouldn't, who married him in England would have known it, she would never have married him, and therefore the entire marriage is a mekach toast. They were never married. So she's allowed, she's kosher 100%, she could marry the young man. So besides the realization of what we lost, when we lost the Rabbi Shev Feinstein's Zatzal, what was the difference between Rabbi Shev and his Talmidim sitting in that room? There's only one difference. That Reb Moshe went and decided, I'm going to try even more because there's a human being there. We have to see the person. If there's a person there, we have to make an effort. I walked out of my house one hot Friday afternoon. My wife asked me to take the garbage. I walked out to the corner. They have those big green garbage dumpsters. A neighbor of mine from across the street, a man who I thought I knew, he was up halfway up and into the garbage dumpster reaching for something. And he pulled out a carton, an empty carton. He crumpled the carton, he threw it back in. Then he jumped up again, he reached for an empty carton, and again he crumpled up and he threw it back in. So I said to this man, what are you doing? I've never seen anybody, I said, what are you doing? So he looked at me with a puzzled look on his face, he said, maybe you haven't heard. On Motzei Shabbos, there's gonna be a garbage strike. They're not gonna be collecting the garbage on this block. I don't want that any of the neighbors on the block should be inconvenienced when they come to the garbage dumpster, so I'm trying to make as much room in the dumpster as possible to crush the air out of those cartons. So a person sometimes wonders, where can I get involved? Where is there a chesed to do? 
How do I help others in my world? There's so many opportunities. There's so many opportunities that are sitting with us. When Rav Pam Zatzal went to the hospital, so Rav Pam was taken in, and he brought his family notice. He had to go into the hospital for a procedure. His family noticed that he took an English art scroll book with him. Art scroll book, I wanted the gondola. They knew that Rav Pam doesn't spend his time reading, so somebody said to him, you know, they figured, must be in a lot of pain. He'll be in pain, he figures he can't learn, at least he'll read something about Rav Moshe, Rav Yankif, whoever it was. So they said to him, probably that's the, that's the issue. He said, no, 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 I'll be able to learn, it's not a problem. The problem is that part of the time I'm going to be sleeping and people are going to come to visit me. They're not going to want to leave. What are they going to do while I'm asleep? So at least I'll have a book there that they could read while they're here to visit me. The average human being who's going to the hospital or who is in pain has an attitude, if I'm in pain, everyone's in pain. The attitude is rarely that I'm in pain, but I got to get concerned about all those other people. That's very rarely the attitude. That's the attitude of a Rav Pam. That's somebody who's a Viracha. And the next level up is Viracha Vesamach Belibo. To see the other person and rejoice for the other person's success. A friend who may be advancing a little more in learning. Somebody who may be doing better financially. Somebody who got a Shidduch. Somebody whose children are successful in yeshiva. And to rejoice for that person without thinking to ourselves, Oi, and where do I fit into the picture over here? Viracha v'samach v'libo, to rejoice for that other person. The shidduch that was made, and shortly after the erusin, they found that the chassan has a very bad illness. And it's going to take a lot of treatment, and it's a potential life changer. So the parents of the chassan immediately called the parents of the kala. They said, we understand you went out of the shidduch. We have no problem. It's clear that you have to be out of the shidduch. And the chassan spoke to them and said, I have no kippeda whatsoever. I understand that the shidduch can't go through. And then he called the kala, and he said, I understand that you have to break the shidduch. The shidduch can't go through. And the kala said, I have no intention of breaking the shidduch. He said, I don't think you understand the severity of the illness. Uh, you, you understand that, the, that, that we might not even make it to the chuppah. He said, I'm not going to break the shidduch. He said, I really don't think you're understanding. You know, your parents have already agreed, and my parents agreed, and I'm telling you, you can't go through with this. She said, yeah, but nobody asked me. She said, we got engaged, and I made a commitment that I'm going to marry you. I'm not going to break that commitment. And the said, but you don't understand. And the four got together, the parents of the chassan, the parents of the kala, the chassan and the kala, and all three were yelling at the kala, you have to break the shidduch. She said, I'm not going to break the shidduch. I made a commitment. So he's having a hard time. So what? So I'm going to be there by his side. I told this story over once at a seminary. And a girl came over to me, she's a cousin of the Kala. The Chassan is 100% cured. The family, they're living together. Chassan and Kala are married, living together. No sign of illness at all. I don't know if it's cause and effect, that you need a Navi. But one thing is clear. A normal, anybody would have dropped out. She said, what's that good? There's, there's somebody on the receiving end over here. I can't just back out. That's idea number one. The altar of Slobodka, Nosson Tzvi Finkel Zetzel had a bocher in the yeshiva. Bocher used to walk around with a long face. Bocher didn't smile. And the altar was, you know, why aren't you smiling? Your face is a rishus a rabbit. You're meeting people all over the place. Why aren't you smiling? And he told the bocher time after time that he's got to smile. And the bocher did not get the message. At a certain point, pay attention carefully, at a certain point they had to cross the border, they had to sneak across the border, Bacharim from the yeshiva. Among them was the altar of Sabatka's son. He wouldn't allow his son to be in the group of Bacharim that this Bachar was in because he held there's a kitrug on this Bachar because he does not smile. That this Bachar is inconsiderate to people every day because he does not smile. So a person walks around in public 
I'm a private person. No, you're not. You belong to the rabbin. You belong to the tzibur. You're not an individual. You're an individual in your own room. But once you leave the confines of your room, you belong to Klai Yisrael. And you have an obligation to Klai Yisrael. You have an obligation of a savior pun in Yafos and Mechabal is called the Besimcha. That's an obligation. And a person in a yeshiva who's walk around, he's working on himself. That's beautiful. You want to work on yourself, work on yourself as much as you want. Be as intense as you want. But that intensity goes with a smile. You're in a Rishus Rabin here. Otherwise, you're a walking boar. You're not allowed to do that. And the altar held that so stark that he wouldn't allow the other, his son, to go with this buffer. He held there's a kitrug on this buffer. Lo chorva Yerushalayim ela she'emidu dineim al din Torah. Chazal say they were good Jews. They kept the halacha. They could tell you the Mishnah Brewer and they could tell you every line in Choshen Mishpat. Al Din Torah is a very high level. The first level to be able to do that is to know what Din Torah is. First, we have to know the halacha. That's a tremendous level. So, why was Yerushalayim destroyed? And the answer is because of Beinat Amlachavero. We're not miming things on Din Torah. In Beinat Amlachavero, we go Lifnimishur Asadin, at least we're supposed to. That's the first lesson of the Tishabov. That's a virach of the Samach Belibo. So he wronged me. So he said something. So she did this. So what? And we want a Kodesh Baruch to cut us a little slack, especially in our day and age. So we have to learn to cut people slack. Okay, you're right. He shouldn't have sat in your seat in shul. The ultimate Avera. Somebody sat in your makom in shul. So, so he sat there. So what do you do? And I don't mean to make jokes on Tisha B'av, but unfortunately this is what we do. If you're at level, ground level, you just walk over and you thumb them out of your seat. It's my moko. And if you're a little better, so then you walk back and forth a few times till he notices you. Was this your moko? Oh, no, no, sit, sit. Right. So what did you walk back and forth for? If I'm going to be a tzaddik, at least let him know that I... I know, but he's got to know I'm a tzaddik. And if you're a person who wants to rebuild your shalayim, you go sit far on the other side of the shul, and you don't make an issue out of it. But I have to dive in my Dalit Amos. Oh, I have to dive in my Dalit Amos, really? And were you concerned about that yesterday when you didn't make it to Minion at all? Were you concerned about that when you missed Myriv? Were you concerned about that when you were Makil on the Shiurim of Mizonos and Kliyasuda? Were you concerned about it then, or only because he's sitting in your seat? There was a yeshiva in the United States. A bucker came sliding down a banister from the second story, from the second floor. And he came sliding down this banister, picking up speed. And as he got to the bottom, he plowed into a little old man and knocked him over. And he felt terrible. And this little old man was Ramesha Feinstein's itself. And so the bucher was frozen and he bent down to pick up the Godelad door who he just knocked off his feet. I heard this from somebody who was in the yeshiva at the time. And he picked up Ramesha before he could stammer out an apology. Ramesha said to him, please forgive me. I usually stand on the other side of the corridor. I realize you bucher like to slide down the banister. For, I had a mental lapse and I was blocking the slide. Please forgive me. The bucher said, no, no, Rebbe, Rebbe, really. You know, it's my, it's my fault. Ramesha said, no, I ask you for mechile. He turned around and he walked away. The next day, the bachar is in the corridor. Ramesha sees him. Ramesha does like this. He waves him over with his hand. So the bachar thought, okay, now he's going to give me a good dose of musr. He gave me 24 hours to get my bearings. And Ramesha again asked him for mechile. And then the next day again, and every single day for two weeks. The bachar was going out of his mind. He went to the mashgiach of the yeshiva, Reb Michal Berenbaum Zatzal. Said to the mashgiach, I knocked Reb Moshe over and he keeps asking me for mechila. What do I do? So Reb Michal said to him, go to Reb Moshe in his office and ask him for a bracha. He'll give you a bracha, and when he gives you a bracha, he'll feel that he's atoned for his terrible misdeed. The kachav, he went to Reb Moshe, he asked Reb Moshe for a bracha, and Reb Moshe gave a bracha in the no longer asked for mechila. 
I often wondered about that story. First of all, you know, anything that you hear about Reb Moshe, which is not believable, you could believe it. Because with Reb Moshe, everything was believable. And Reb Moshe's Ben Adam L'Chavera sensitivity was so developed, there was nobody who cared about Klai Yisrael as much as Reb Moshe Feinstein. And I often thought to myself, what did Reb Moshe, what was really going through his head? What was going through Reb Moshe's mind that he was asking for Mechila? And there are one of two possibilities. Possibility number one is that Reb Moshe Madregoso genuinely felt that since Bochrim slide down banisters, he should have anticipated not putting a Bochrim in that uncomfortable position of knocking him over. It's a possibility. There's another possibility, and I would say even a probability, a likelihood, that Reb Moshe, before he even hit the ground, his mind, our minds work so fast. And I'm convinced that Reb Moshe, before he even hit the ground, knew he would get up and ask for Mechila. Because if a bachar knocks over the Godelot door, that could be a devastating act that could be a life ruiner. And Reb Moshe gets up and says to the bachar, I apologize. So that the bachar should not have time to dwell on the fact that perhaps he's guilty for knocking over Reb Moshe. And the sensitivity for another human being was such Viracha, you see there's somebody else in your world. The Gemara says that Rabbi Chiyah was in a shir by Rabbi Yudah Anasi. And when Rabbi Chiyah, Rabbi Yudah Anasi was giving the shir, he smelled garlic in the room. One of the Bacharim had eaten garlic. And the odor was so powerful, he could not continue the shir. So Rabbi Yudah Anasi said, whoever ate the garlic, please exit. And Rabbi Chia realized that if the person, the guilty party, would get up and leave, he'd be so embarrassed. So Rabbi Chia, without a moment's hesitation, stood up, took the blame, the shame, the degradation, stood up, and he walked out of the room. The other Talmudim saw what Rabbi Chia did. They picked up his drift. So they stood up and they walked out of the room as well. Rabbi Huda Anasi was left with no Talmudim. The next day, his son, Rabbi Shimon, came to Rabbi Chia. He said, you caused my father a lot of tsar by walking out of that shiru. And Rabbi Chia said to him, Chas v'shalom lo Israel." I could not sit by idly and watch while that young man would be embarrassed and put to shame. I had to take the blame for myself. Obviously, there's a machlokas between Rabbi and Rabbi Chia. Rabbi held that it's your own fault, don't eat garlic before the shear and cause public bittel Torah. And therefore, if you did it, you should have gotten up and walked out before I told you to. Rabbi Chia said, right, but even so, I can't stand by idly and watch a Jew being embarrassed. That's a sensitivity, that's viracha v'samach v'libo. That's the idea of a tisha of the first idea, to see the other person, to realize there's another person in our world. There's a second form of building. To rebuild the Churvos Yerushalayim, there's a second form of building that we could engage in. There's a medrash that says, everybody knows one of the most enigmatic personalities that we find in Torah is Og Melech HaBoshon. Og Melech HaBoshon, according to the medrash, he's around at the time of Tevas Noach. He's around at the time of Avram Avinu. And he's still around where Klai Yisrael want to get into Eretz Yisrael. Og Melech is still there. Make a cheshbin from the time of the Teva to the time they entered Eretz Yisrael. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. What did Og Melech do that he was zochet to such arichus yomim? He wanted Avram killed so he could take Sarah. He was blocking Klai Yisrael's entrance. Moshe Rabbeinu had to kill him and stab him in the ankle. What was it that Og Melech had as a schus? There's a Targum Yonason that says that when Og Melech HaBoshan saw Avram and Sarah, he came to them and he said, the two of you are beautiful like a tree alongside a brook. You're beautiful like a tree alongside a brook. What a beautiful scene. They put it on all the cards. A beautiful tree next to a brook's flowing water. And the Targum Yonason says for that compliment, Og Melech HaBoshen was Zochet HaRichus Yamin. He built somebody else up. 
He took another human being and said something that can make them feel good, positive about themselves. And when a person feels positive, they achieve more. And we have that opportunity every day to build people up, to compliment people, to tell a guy you asked a good kasha in sheer. That was a very generous thing that you did. To not think about it and only say it at a house of Avelus when you're going to be Menachem Avlo Rachman Litzlan. And then tell the family what you thought of him. You could tell him before he's nifter. You could tell him while he's alive and be responsible for his further achievements. Says the Targum, why was it that Og Melech HaBoshan was then killed by the descendants of Avram and Sarah? Because in the next sentence, he gave them a shtoch. In the next sentence, he said, you're beautiful like trees alongside a brook, but you don't produce peros. You don't produce fruit. At that moment was Nigzar and Og Melech HaBoshan, he's going to be killed. Moves v'chayim b'yad alosha. The mouth, the building, person is able to build other people. That's what we're meant to be doing with our tongues. That's what we're meant to be spending our lives doing. That's what we're meant to make a career out of ourselves. Building other people, not tearing them down. Building other people results in the rebuilding of your Yerushalayim. There's a man who took on a project of saying Kaddish for an entire year. Somebody was nifter, did not have somebody to say Kaddish on after them. Man took on his project, he, would, he agreed that he would say Kaddish for an entire year. It's a very difficult challenge. Every day, three times a day, he had to get to shul, he had to wake up early. A month passed, two months passed, it was really getting hard. At a certain point, he decided, this is it, this is my last day, i got to call up the lady and tell her I can't say Kaddish for her husband anymore. So he went to show that morning, finished davening Shachris, he walked outside to his car, and as he sat down in his car, one of the men from Shul comes running out, Beryl, Beryl, i got to tell you something. He says, yeah. He says, I just want to tell you, I'm so impressed that you've taken on this project of saying Kaddish. I know it's not easy. And I know that it's a commitment, and I'm really impressed. I've been inspired myself to push in my areas of life and commitment a little harder because I see what you're doing with this Kaddish. The man finished out the year of saying Kaddish. When he realized the impression it was making on others, that somebody sees, somebody notices, we're human. We need that. And he realized somebody sees this. Somebody is there to tell me, to give me a kind word, a word of encouragement. And a bocher and a yeshiva comes to you, and he asks you a question. Bachar asks to learn for a few minutes. You don't have time for a Bachar to answer him a question. You don't have time to help him out. You know you're doing so well at your level. Sit down with him. Put an arm around his shoulder. Learn with him for a few minutes. Encourage him in his growth just like you were encouraged in your growth. That rebuilds your shalayim. That's the purpose. That's an og melech habosham. We learn what our purpose is in life, and that's our purpose. We want a Kodesh Baruch Hu to look at us and say, I'll rebuild for you. But a Kodesh Baruch Hu works me to connect me to. If we build, he builds. If we destroy, a Kodesh Baruch Hu destroys. Korodfea yisigua beina metzorim. The enemies have caught up to Kla Yisrael, difficult period of the year, period of the year when everybody is suffering. And all the enemies, that's when they made their achievements. That's when Klaisel suffered their downfall throughout the years. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the Mephoshim say, Rodfeha breaks into two words. Rodef Ka. Rodef Ka means somebody who's chasing a Kodesh Baruch that means this is a period of the year where we have a potential to be rodef ka. That we have a potential to chase after our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And we have a potential at this point of the year to grow in ways that we don't always have a chance to grow. So, unfortunately throughout Jewish history, there have always been people who've had to teach us how high we could reach, how high we could grow. 
our commitment to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Gemara says, a very touching story in Gittin. The son and the daughter of Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha, who were captured by Roman captors. Liyamim nizdav gushnehem, these two Romans got together. Bimakom echot. Zeomer yesh li eved she'en ki yofyo v'chol ha'olam. I've captured an Ebed, these two are so beautiful, I've captured a slave whose beauty is beyond compare. I have a Shifcha whose beauty is unmatched anywhere in the world. Let's marry them to each other. We'll divide up the offspring. He put them into a room. The boy sat in the care in the corner of the room. The Zo Yashva, the Karen Zavizo, she sat in her corner. Zelmer Ani Koin ben Kohanim Gedolim, I descend from Kohanim Gedolim. Esa Shifcha, I'm going to marry a maidservant. Doesn't even know if she's Jewish. She's in a dark room, some maidservant that was put in there. Bizosomeras Ani Kohenis Bas Kohanim Gedolim, she thought to herself, I descend from Kohanim Gedolim. And I'll say, La Eved, I should marry a slave. Ubachu kolalayla. They cried all night. Kevan she'ala omura shachar hikiru zezeh. When this morning broke, they recognized each other at the crack of dawn. They saw each other. There was light in the room. V'naflu zel zeh v'go bivchiyad she'yotza nishmasa. They fell on each other's arms. They cried their neshamas out. For these I cry, for these I weep. I have a question. I have a question. Why did they cry? They woke up in the morning, the morning broke, they recognized each other. So, okay, it's an emotional moment. You found your long lost sister. You found your long lost brother. Okay, could be. There's got to be a little more depth. Why were they crying? I think there are two answers to why they were crying. The answer number one is because I was in a room. The room was dark. There was another Jew in that room. And I made an assumption about that Jew. I never saw him. I just assumed he's no good. He's not at my level. He's not at my madriga. Then the sun goes up and you see it's a Ben Kohanim Gedolim. It's a Bas Kohanim Gedolim. We're a Mamleches Kohanim Begoy Kadosh, every one of us. That Jew we're writing off, that Jew's not good enough for us. And then the sun comes up and we see that Jew. You see the Jew. That's exactly what our problem is. I see who I was next to in a base medrash, and I see my neighbor down the block. And Rabosai, forgive me for saying it. We could disagree with a shita, especially if a shita is krum. We can't tolerate a shita that's krum. But it has nothing to do with the person behind the shita. The person behind the shita is a Jew, and regardless of his shita, I invite him for Shabbos. And I would help him fix a flat tire. It has nothing to do with him personally. Yeshita is wrong. We don't tolerate the right. We don't call Sheker MS. But that has nothing to do with the individual Jew who's sitting in that dark room with me. And when that sun comes up, I have to see there was a Jew in that room. I think that's the first reason they cried. I think there's another reason they cried. And I think that this is the Pashup Shat in the Gemara. And I think that this really hurts. I think they cried because as the sun comes up and he realizes, do you know how close I came to being coming defiled? There was a girl there and it could have been my sister, Achyuv Kores. And I escaped that by, by, the, by, by a thrift strand of hair. For that, it's worth crying. It could have been such a tragedy and it was avoided. For that, it's crying. So a person has to ask himself, if I am alone in a room, 
with something worse than a shifcha. I'm alone in a room with some sort of electronic instrument that has far worse than shifchas on it. Far worse than defilement. Shouldn't I cry? I have to wait for daylight. Shouldn't I cry at the realization that not only I could become defiled, and I'm close to becoming defiled, shouldn't I cry for all the times I have become defiled? And if they cried, then we should cry. So a Tisha B'Av comes along, the person has an entire day, nobody's going anywhere. There's nothing to do. The person has to stop and think, you know what? Isn't it enough to stop? Isn't it time to stop with the monkey business already? Isn't it just time to stop? And it used to be that a person is on a bus in Yerushalayim, Yer HaKodesh. You see a Avrech at a bus stop, a Yeshiva Bachar at a bus stop with a Mishnayis in his hands. Nowadays, rare. It's an instrument where, let's see who else I could bother now, because I have nothing to do. That's what we've come to. We don't have what to do to fill our time. We don't have what to do in a Yerushalayim or a Kodesh waiting for a bus or standing in line at a bank other than playing around. And we want a Kodesh Baruch to look at, look how devoted we are. Said today the Asara Aruge Malchus. Rabbi Akiva was Moser Nefesh for Torah and he was killed. Rabbi Hanita ben Taranyon was burned for being Moser Nefesh for Torah. Nobody here has to be killed and nobody here has to be burnt. I dare anyone in this space, Medrash, leave your cell phone home just for the morning Seder. That's a serious nefesh in our door. That's a lesson from Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Hanita ben Taradian. I dare you, any one of you, leave it home for one Seder. Take up the challenge. That's Mesiris Nefesh Mamish. Lefum Tsara Agra. Tov Echad Betsar Himeya Shalom Betsar. That's what rebuilds Yerushalayim. Finally, there was a Rebbe from this yeshiva who was once visiting the Kaisel. I don't remember if it was on Tisha B'Av or it was the day before Tisha B'Av. It was during the nine days for sure. I don't remember exactly when. Went to the Kaisel. And a young lady, not Jewish, she comes over to him and she says, this is where the temple stood, isn't it? Yes, it is. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Are there going to be sacrifices here today? Valid question. Swedish tourist. Are there going to be sacrifices? So he said to her, as of right now, no. But perhaps later today there will be. And it's not his original answer. Because the Gemara says when Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asked Elio Anovi, when is Mashiach coming? Elio Anovi said to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Hayom. Yeshua ben Levi said, a lot of Hayoms have passed. Mashiach hasn't come. Elio Anovi said, Hayom. In Bekolos Ishmo, today, on one condition, in Bekolos Ishmo, if you obey Akkadosh Borchu, if you listen to Akkadosh Borchu, you do the Ratzon of Hashem, Hayom, then Mashiach comes today. But that takes a lot in Bekolos Ishmo. Bekolos Ishmo doesn't mean hearing the voice, Tishmo means obeying the voice. Tishmo means doing those things that are difficult, doing those things that involve Mesiris Nefesh, doing those things that involve Viracha, the Samach Belibo, seeing other people. And if we carry out and use Tisha B'Av properly, the whole three weeks culminating today, and we internalize the message, and we make the effort and take a few steps, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees and he responds. You're trying to build then I, in turn, will also build, but only one condition. Hayom im bichkolos ishmo. If you obey, then even if right now, no, perhaps, indeed, later today. <laughs>